go ahead and begin that. And I'll just um, welcome you guys. Um, this is a session to talk about um, what I had just shared, which is a developing set of resources for writers um, that uh, the writing fellows and I are spending some part of the summer, um, oops, setting up. Um, and uh, we just wanted to let people know that this was um, in the verse. I keep looking at the screen instead of bad habit, instead of at the camera and out at um, real people who are <laughs> seated in front of me. So my apologies for, for that. Um, but uh, anyway, we wanted to let people know kind of that this was in the works and just like solicit ideas for the development of this um, set of resources. I'll just say um, I prepared a couple of slides. Uh, oh, oh, and let me um, introduce to the um, writing fellows. Um, Ken um, is sitting oh, here. Hello, everybody. Um, writing fellow for um, Liberal Arts and Sciences. Amanda Trainum on screen, writing fellow for School of Business. Hello. <laughs> Stephanie Pritchard, the um, director of the Writing Fellows uh, Program. Um, and I'm uh, Michael Murphy. I uh, coordinate uh, the Writing Across Curriculum program and work with the, the fellows uh, um, on this project and, and on other projects. So um, I will just kind of begin with a quick description. And you guys can jump in if there are things that I've forgotten or gotten wrong, too. You can let me know. Um, again, we thought about setting this up not for sure kind of as a replacement for um, rules for writers. Um, but we thought about it as a potential kind of alternative and as um, uh, you know, um, potentially a, a replacement maybe down the road. If it works out, if we find that um, it's manageable to put it up and to keep it up, um, if students find it um, kind of useful. Um, and we're hoping that this fall, we'll assemble at least a couple of pieces of it and try it out with students. We've done a, a couple of individual pages and response has been good so far. Um, but uh, that's the, the project. The reasons to do it are, um, first of all, the cost. If it ever does become a replacement for rules for writers, um, which um, English 102 sections will not um, require this time, uh, th this academic year, we won't require the purchase of, of uh, rules for writers as we have done in the past. That will, uh, alone will save students. Um, if everybody buys rules for writers and, and actually, if everybody buys rules for writers at the bookstore, I think it stands to be even appreciably more than $40,000 a year. But that a, was a kind of a ballpark estimate I came, came up with on the basis of the figures that the, the bookstore gave me and then kind of guesswork about how many students buy it in some other form on Amazon or whatever. Um, so the bulk of that figure, I think it was 28,000 actually, was um, bookstore money. Um, so uh, anyway, an appreciable amount of money um, each year. And we also found it that faculty, to my mind, we didn't do a sort of a careful study of this, but anecdotally faculty across campus seemed, and in the English department too, seemed to actually, even though, even if they assigned it, seemed to be using it kind of less than, than they used to. Um, it also occurred to us that a, that a like campus curated and produced and curated maybe set of, set of resources um, would have a sort of strong effect on students that students would find it in some way authoritative. Like we had authorized this was like the handbook for, or the set of resources kind of for, for Sumi Oswego, um, as well as it, that it might have a kind of unifying effect on, you know, writing across the curriculum faculty across campus that um, there'd be a, a sense that we were all in the, you know, promotion of um, the culture of writing on campus that we had some, uh, we, we were part of some sort of shared enterprise and, and uh, and project um, around academic writing. Um, it also um, seemed to us in a more tangible way uh, um, to provide an opportunity that writing across curriculum hadn't really done so much in the past for um, departments to contribute. I know that faculty develop resources, of course, connected to the writing that their students do. Um, there's some level of like sharing of assignments, some standing assignments for certain classes. But we also thought that this um, website might be a repository for some of that stuff that certain departments might even um, begin to um, put together something like disciplinary style guides, you know, which is something I've been um, trying to get departments to do for a long time. So. Um, anyway, um, it seems like a place we might kind of come together. I've put the no the notes. Um, everybody can have will have access. And then, you know what? I don't. I just share here. Um, let me share in the chat. Can we chat from here? I can. Okay, that's the. Um, 
uh, link for these notes, and you'll find here a link for um, the, the website itself, for the um, landing page of this um, evolving um, resources for writers site. Um, this is what we imagined as a kind of a, a landing page. Um, and it would be, there would be links to basically different sorts of sections. Okay, um, as well as a complete kind of table of, of contents. Um, quick links at the bottom for things like the Writing Center um, and Penfield Library, uh, the Writing Across the Curriculum site, the Dean's Writing Awards, um, the Writing Fellows, um, and the, probably other um, quick links. But that the main function of this landing page would be to direct students either to a complete kind of set of the contents. I think we might want to change because we shifted away from a sort of a handbook model to a set of resources, we might want to change the label of table of contents, but something like complete contents. Um, and then different sections, right? Um, one on um, why um, is, what is academic writing and why do it? Um, another on writing processes, a third on like rhetorical concepts, um, one on grammar and mechanics. This um, actually started because somebody on the writing across the curriculum uh, uh, the steering committee asked if we could just like develop some basic sorts of grammar exercises for common uh, error, error patterns um, uh, in-house and, and let students have access to them. Um, that's actually become cumbersome on rules for writers. The online interface is somewhat difficult. Um, and then a section on writing from sources, research writing, as well as a section on writing in the disciplines, which is where we imagined that these sort of disciplinary um, uh, writer's guides uh, might be housed. And then uh, maybe a, a campus uh, writing calendar too. If we go to the complete table of contents, just put it in, take it out of edit mode. Um, you get a sense sort of of what might be included in each um, section. Um, under what's academic writing and why do it, some discussion of you know, writing and its place in academic communities, uh, the kind of variance of language and genre across disciplines, um, occasions and purposes for academic writing. So that, um, we might, there might be some discussion of um, specific kinds of um, genres, what it means to make a claim, you know, and not sort of really fully you know, relatively simple and direct um, kinds of uh, discussions. Um, what annotated bibliographies um, are um, reviews of literature prospectuses? Um, and then too, writing, in, you know, the place of, of writing in citizenship and kind of public life, um, as well as um, personal writing and writing for economic value. We um, just yesterday started to talk about um, developing a section connected to writing in the first year. So that um, first year students would have some, some immediate sort of sense of um, orientation I think, in terms of um, writing. You know, what are they doing in English 1 or 2? How's that connected to um, writing across the curriculum and the other kinds of writing courses they should expect? Um, where should they go to get help? You know, um, uh, you know, in a really sort of tangible and easy way um, on campus, um, both virtually and, and um, in person. Um, a section on writing processes, okay? And we tried to be kind of um, variable uh, here in terms of what we might include. Um, I think I think lots of one one of one of the reasons, honestly, that at least for me, that we thought about doing this was that um, all of the writing handbooks we looked at, at least some number of them, is, uh, all of them, give some amount. That's what I mean to say of like really bad um, semi-bogus advice, semi-bogus and oversimple advice. A lot of it has to do, I find, with writing processes. Like start with an outline. You know, my students seem to have that kind of as a um, uh, commonplace of you know, what, you know, what's involved in writing. Start with the Roman numeral outline, and I think in lots of ways it kind of handicaps them. Um, I think we wanted to suggest lots of things about sort of ex ex using writing really to sort of explore ideas kind of in this um, writing processes section. Um, and we wanted to distinguish, especially I think, between um, that sort of exploratory moment and then some moment um, uh, that feels more like editing. The rhetorical concepts piece, we've imagined this, I think we've imagined this as most useful kind of for college writing courses for English 102 and other courses in it, um, that we, we teach in, in English connected in some ways to rhetorical issues, to argumentation, though I think they might have some 
uh, utility other other places on campus too. Um, and then the grammar and um, mechanics section. And you guys, you can see that we've begun to fill out at least a couple of the um, pages here. That there's um, a page that's sort of an overview, a, a discussion of what grammar is and kind of how it works. Um, um, the notion that error is patterned, um, a, a real sort of general linguistics oriented discussion, um, as well as um, discussions in, uh, of and exercises on comma splices, two common um, error patterns, comma splices, and then not actually um, an error pattern exactly, but a feature, right? Um, the difference between active and passive voice. Um, a section on sourced writing, okay, much of which we'd imagined would be um, done by, there'd be a few sort of general discussions, but this is a, a big part of the um, resource that we thought we might farm out to um, other uh, sites, especially Purdue Owl. You know, we sort of looked around and it feels to us like Purdue Owl is the most approachable and um, uh, easy and efficient and kind of well, well set up um, discussion, especially of citation forms. Um, and then that section that I was talking about uh, connected um, to writing and disciplines. Here's where I thought we, we might include not just um, departmental writing plans, which I think might be really useful um, in the Dean's Writing Award Archive. I think it'd be great if students, we made those alive, and students had some kind of access to what's been imagined ex exemplary writing in, in each uh, major. But then also maybe, you know, ideally to, to um, uh, some kind of uh, set of uh, disciplinary uh, style guides. Again, I think that could be a really useful thing for students and, and um, could have a really useful uh, kind of general effect on the culture of writing on campus. Um, so anyway, that's what we uh, had thought about in terms of just like the basic sort of um, um, set of things that the, the um, website would, would address. Um, so I guess what we wanted to do, first of all, let me, I guess I should be asking, um, Ken, Stephanie, Amanda, have I left anything out? Is there anything else I should be saying here? Okay, good. Then maybe I've given a, probably I've talked too long. <laughs> That's probably what that means. But um, the, let me just like uh, open the floor then. I guess what really what we're looking for is a sense of whether you think this would be a useful kind of resource and then two other things that we should do. Are there things that should go in here? Should we imagine some of this differently? Um, thoughts about it? Oh, please, please do it. Uh, <laughs> that was Ann? Ann, yeah. Um, and a carryover from our previ your previous session. Yeah, um, I seem to be carrying the torch here in the physics department, emphasizing uh, good writing. And I gather up from all sorts of places, even the plagiarism things and stuff like that, um, resources for my students. And again, people think I'm out in left field that I'd love to have what I'm asking of my students uh, to be part of the college culture and not just me being the outlier. So please, please, please. And I could offer templates for things like samples, scientific posters for Quest, or um, you know, I think some standard formatting things that would help students see that, oh, this term paper that they've written uh, in, in history, you know, a term paper could still be the same sort of strategy in physics, but the content's different. And so that we weren't all out on our individual ice flows here. Um, yeah, and I'll say one of, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is, is wanting to, in, in a very, you know, easy, minor way, involve faculty from across uh, the school. So, so one of the things we've talked about is uh, we'd love if, you know, at some point you would write a, a brief thing about, you know, basically what, what does writing um, as we go in physics look like? What, what do you and your colleagues want? So students can read you know, whatever it is specifically that you're looking for in, in the writing that, that you produce. Well, I can answer a little bit directly right now at the very preliminary level, labor, laboratory reports, this classic student laboratory report. Um, and I mean, and that, yep. But I, I, I mean, like all of those little um, specialized things that students may not know, especially just starting to take the classes, but like, what uh, do you prefer the lab reports with a robust introduction, or do you just want no, you know, only the fact, like whatever it is? Um, uh, well, that that's um, the, the great debate 
of what we call informal versus formal lab reports. Um, that is, um, can you survive grading all of them and still make it to the end of the semester? Can they survive writing all of them until and still make it to the end of the semester? My personal view is that I use the informal report to phase in different parts of the lab report. So this week we start, I mean, we always have to do the data analysis and the discussion, right? You have to do the physics part. Um, but when I teach labs, I phase in, oh, this week we're working on the introduction and theory passages. Oh, this experiment lends itself to writing the experimental procedure and description of the apparatus path. And so I phase it in over four weeks or so, and then there's the first formal report. And then I repeat the process for the next four weeks, and then there's the second formal report. Uh, that's how I choose to do it. My colleagues don't necessarily follow the same plan. Um, for intermediate level lab reports, then they've got to be a lot more responsible for looking at other additional resources to bring in for their theory and their background and their analysis. Um, and then within my some of my lecture classes it's actually term papers and presentations so i and eventually writing things uh in the style of a peer-reviewed journal article so and a term and a senior paper but so a whole progression whole progression in a nutshell like if i were a physics student i would love i would love some kind of condensed um representation of that where if i'm in the intermediate you know intermediate physics then I know okay okay i'm supposed to buckle down and do more of this now you know just the general philosophy that because each department obviously has, has a little bit different priorities and all of that um you as an actual person or you as a physics student i don't know that i can get all my colleagues like no, no, if, cats. I, if i were a student if i i know a little bit i read some, yeah. I read some stephen hawking i'm good i'm good yeah no that's um we don't have a central message, I would say. So that's why I would love to have some some campus wide thing that could strengthen the message that I see that physics needs or whoever needs. Um, so it's a, a more unified approach. It, it, and I'll say from the perspective of literary studies, though, this has changed since I was in graduate school. I, I can when I went to graduate school, there was a moment when like you would walk in and, and like your your professors weren't quite and fisticuffs, but it was pretty close. Like you walk in and there would be these like 30 page memos. This was back in the day of like paper, 30 page memos um, from like the Marxist collective. And then they're like 30, another, you know, 15 page response from somebody else. And like there was, there's an, an, an incredible fractiousness is what I would say in literary studies for a long time. And so people write from very different points of view. Again, I think that's changed a little bit in the last 10 or 20 years, but um I, I what i was going to say was i think that under those circumstances especially i think students i know that i would have felt found some great comfort in some kind of like guide to who these people were and what perspectives they they worked from and so i guess what i was going to say was um you know i've been talking about disciplinary um style guides i don't know if that's something um you, you would uh consider or, or that you think physics would, would consider but like some discussion at the beginning of um I, informal i volunteer if you want it there well that's wonderful i don't um one thing let's keep talking about that one one i've imagined trying to develop these we got in order to do set this up we got a um thirty six hundred dollar split four ways um uh, curriculum innovation grant and so i've been thinking that that might be a way to do it over the summer um in connection with departments i don't know if they'll they'll uh, do, that is to develop um, disciplinary style guides so i don't know if that's something you would you uh, consider but uh, but that's something we could we could talk about if this this kind of pans out in the fall and people we are able to put it together effectively and people students seem to like it um maybe that's something we could propose for next summer sure certainly great other thoughts about stuff like we should include or general comments or from the perspective of the writing center, Steve, or I am. Um, hi, hi, everyone. This is Steve Smith, Writing Center. Um, one of the things that I like about the Purdue site and, and visiting that site 
um, are the are the quizzes that they have on there. You could do like, for example, if you're working on uh, comma usage, and you can do like a little quiz and put the take commas out or put them in, however it's it, they do it on there, and um, it will let you know if you if you did it correctly, if you had the correct answer or not. I don't know how how the, how difficult and challenging it would be to try to insert some of that uh, in, into this, but that I think students would find that hands on uh, with the chance to do some exercises extremely beneficial. Yeah, we've just been talking about that. Somebody else want to speak to that, or should I just? Um, we had a couple of different ideas for that, Steve, because we agreed too that having some exercises would be really, really helpful. Um, we're experimenting with a couple of options. Uh, one would be kind of like you typically see exercises where students like would be asked a series of questions or see a series of examples and then they could input their responses and find out if they're right or wrong. Um, we're also thinking about doing uh, a couple of videos alongside the content that we're going to post and have the videos not be, you know, like completely interactive, but sort of, you know, like embed our quiz questions in the video so that students can kind of get, you know, they can get the question, they can think about it a little bit, and then they can get our response as to like, what would be the best answer and an explanation about that answer. So we're sort of thinking about a couple of different things um, in that regard, but uh, we agree that having some sort of like quizzes or having a way for students to sort of practice would be really, really helpful. Yeah, wonderful, great. Yes, I love the idea of practice and exercises. Yes, please, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I'm just wondering, and I'm, I hope this is taken in the spirit in which it's intended, which is to be helpful, but there really are a lot of things out there already and to help you from having to reinvent the wheel you know, you mentioned earlier this kind of being a curated collection, so that even if you were linking to other sources, you know, Grammar Girl or whatever, whoever it is, whatever it is, OWL, that, you know, you might not have to create as much on your own, but I don't know, like, what the copyright things and how you feel about that and all that other stuff. So just... So we, yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about that, Karen. You're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and we, we've specifically talked about not wanting to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I, I contacted the, the gen who runs the Purdue OWL, you know, just, uh, you know, we wouldn't borrow their actual content because that's not cool. That's plagiarism. We're against plagiarism. Um, but yeah, um, what, there, there's no point to create the extensive resource that they have on certain things. The, the idea was to, to use it, right, to curate those resources and to do it uh, in an Oswego way for, for Oswego students specifically. And so, yeah, we have thought, tried to think a lot and, and to, we looked around a lot for um, like grammar stuff too. We like, thought about including um, uh, exercises and stuff. In, in some ways, I guess we, we each time we do it, we try to balance the sort of effort involved in mm -hmm. creating something with the, the the leading somebody out of the the site, as well as some sense of the, the availability of good good resources. You know, we haven't found lots of stuff um, that's really available, with the exception of Purdue Out, it's really available, free and with like kind of works well and felt like it it uh, you know is a, a, of a piece kind of with the other advice. That, that we offer on that, around what we've done so far, at least. So yes, it is something that we should continue to, to think about. These are the kinds of just, I will go, I'll just jump back to what Stephanie was um, explaining. These are the kinds of um, uh, films, the way we'd imagine embedding short films and potentially um, exercises. One thing, Steve, about the exercises that we've been trying to figure out, and people may have ideas about this in terms of some kind of facility, um, we've done this on Google Forms because the the website we've put we've put up and we think we're probably likely to use Google Sites for. So Google Forms works really well, um, and, and you can get answers. But the only thing is, you can't get an answer at least so far as we've been able to figure out so far. You can't get an answer for each individual question. Like you can't get an answer immediately. Mm -hmm. So you choose your and it says no wrong one. Mm -hmm. Here's the right one. Choose that. 
Um, so there's not that kind of instant feedback. You get like 20 questions, do them all, and then you get your response. It's, right. it, it's also difficult because there are 11 trillion different ways to, to fix a sentence if there's a, a comma problem. Like that's, there's just a million ways to do yeah. it. Right. I know that's a concern for our students. They're like, they're technical folks. They want the right. I mean, we're problem solvers and design thinkers and all of that stuff, but writing, they're like, what's the right way you want it, Dykeman? <laughs> I've sort of almost given up on commas. I, I'm dying on the uh, active versus passive voice hill. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, you can see if you guys, in fact, I was going to invite people who have not seen this before to take a look at, we have that, you know, that page on comma splices, the a page on active and passive voice, and then a page two on, on the truth about grammar and, and error patterns. And one of the things actually, Karen, that we say is um, here is that um, grammar it, it might disappoint your student, <laughs> but that there is something relative. You know, we introduced the notion of registered different um, um, sets of conventions for different um, contexts. And so um, um, we, I think that we've tried to be relatively clear and um, uh, accessible to offer kind of tangible answers um, at the same time that we don't, we've tried not to soft pedal. So what are, really are the complexities of, you don't always know if, um, you, if your teacher at the simplest possible level um, wants you to use, you know, um, um, the Oxford comma or not. <laughs> now, there are lots of things that are sort of stopped. Can, can you use a, can you begin a sentence with a conjunction? You know, in this kind of language, and the science is certainly not, right? But in literary studies, there's almost a sense of obligation, at least for some, some folks. I have a question for you. How do you all feel about Grammarly.com? I, I, I'm, I'm conflicted because on one hand, um, I had a student whose writing was very, very, very poor. And then the next paper was, was coherent. Um, and, and I said, well, what did you do? And, and so, and he, he had used Grammarly. And on one hand, any, any tool that helps you produce better prose, okay, that's great. But on the other hand, it, it is getting to the point where the computers are actually doing some of the writing. Um, <laughs> even, even in Google, Docs, like the predictive text, um, I, I don't like. I think it's bad that that for just for cognitive processes that the, that we're often not writing our own prose. We're just letting the computer complete the sentence for us according to what it thinks that we might want. So, so, so I am torn. I know that's a that's a nice nuanced answer. <laughs> I'm similar. I'm, I'm also very torn with it. Um, if you don't buy it, though, I like it, what it's preliminarily set up for. It will tell you you have comma splices, you have run on sentences, you have subject verb disagreements. Like it will tell you the errors if you don't purchase it. But when you do, that's when they actually start changing it, which to me feels very plagiarize e because it's not their words, it's not their, it is their ideas, but it's not their words. And also it automatizes it. If you have the same error across multiple different students, they'll correct it in the same exact way. So kind of automatizes writing, which makes it less significant, less, you know, their own kind of work. So I'm, again, I'm torn very, very similar to. to okay. Ken. Well, I'm going to ask this from two, I was asking this from two different views. Um, I actually went back this year to teach the intro labs for the first time in a while by happenstance. And with the advent of electronic submissions um, with remote learning, I actually asked them to send me not only PDFs, but their raw word documents. And I cut and paste, well, I cut and pasted their raw word documents into Grammarly and found lots of errors, right? And so I sent the students back the reports and said, this is the kind of stuff I'm looking for. You know, this makes, this makes a difference. Um, yes, I see that the newer subscription version actually wants to offer sentence rewrites. Um, I didn't get into that. Um, but in terms of that though, um, and I don't wanna insult anybody here. If you went to a writing tutor, wouldn't a writing tutor make suggestions about how to rephrase things? 
Oh, or that... am I just confusing a writing tutor with my mom sitting at the kitchen table when I was in high school? Yeah. No, 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 that's 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 a great thought. But what, what, what I love about the tutors, because obviously um, I know I know it was all of us, Amanda and Stephanie and I, Stephanie and I have all done lots of tutoring. Um, it's it's not just you're not just telling the student put a comma there, you're saying, no, 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 we put a comma there because see how we're we're gluing together a sentence and a not sentence, right? So we need to. We, we need we need the, the comma between here or this is a comma splice. See how these are two complete sentences. It takes forever. It takes forever. It's yeah. it's definitely oh, yeah. just, I don't know, capitalize, capitalize Google, right? We say we capitalize Google because it's a proper noun. There's only one Google in the whole world. Um, whereas Grammarly, I don't know how much it does that, but but no, the, the writing center tutors do all, do the same the same kind of thing. Um it's 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 essentially instruction. Yeah, there's yeah. A, a conversation. Mm -hmm. that takes place and um and, and ex explanation is given and so on to hopefully yeah. that happens regularly with the writing tutors and part of the conversation too i think is you know i guess i could say this as an instructor but then also as you know um, having been a, a tutor too there's the part of the conversation is this like moment of like measurement where you say something you say does anything look funny here from the right. sort of plumb people exactly. for a sense of like what's up with this? Maybe there ought to be have some sense of why there ought to be a comma, um, and if you can get them to articulate this, you know, sentence not sentence thing. I like that <laughs> language. Um, that's a great thing. That is the conversation that it, there's always a kind of judgment that you make as a tutor. Okay. There's always we we like to really promote reading aloud when we're working with students on their papers too. You know, the tutors reading sections aloud. The two T's reading sections aloud because you you all know our our ear can pick up on a, a lot of issues with with our writing as opposed to when we read silently too. Yeah. So that's a that's a big benefit. Yep. Yeah. Well, I guess since among everybody here, I'm not the professional writing instructor, right? I'm trying to improve writing as they're doing physics like modern physics lab is so much it's learning physics learning experimental work learning data analysis learning computer programs learning writing all in the context of modern physics experiments for example for the sophomores in the physics major so for me uh using grammarly to find errors in common written English to quote Barbara Wolford, you know, that kind of gateway requirement, you know, please submit something that has at least the basics covered. Um, I, I, hate, I hate to talk too much, but but Anne, yeah, uh, we've also talked a lot about, uh, yes, the physics teachers want to teach physics. Uh, that That is a thousand percent understandable. So that's why we'd love for uh, for, for more instructors to lean on the writing center, to lean on other resources for doing the, the boring basics. Because I know you want to talk about black holes and, and the speed of light and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so that, that's our that's also our philosophy. I was going to say to jump in and just say about grammar checkers. Well, two things. First of all, you, you will notice I've highlighted on screen. Um, we're trying offering some like beginning uh, sense of you know our feelings about this. This is something too that we felt like we ought to offer advice about because, but like it or not, you know whether we think they're good things or bad things, our students will use them. In fact, they'll go on on you know Google Docs. They'll simply when they see the the um, indication, they'll simply like make that change. Um, what I, I guess myself as an instructor. And what I didn't really like, one of the things I didn't like about Grammarly when I subscribed four or five years ago was that it, there, there was some really automated quality about the way in which changes could, could be made. Um, and again, I, I think that happens on, happens on uh, Microsoft Word too, um, that, that uh, it's re really easy to just sort of like go through and do grammar check and sort of changes. Um, I guess I would like to, my sense of at least part of this page is that we'll, we'll try to encourage students to use these kinds of grammar checks as ways to look more closely at what's there. Because that's the other thing. Lots of times um, I find that students will wrongly do stuff because the grammar checker has misunderstood what it is they're trying to say and do, as well as kind of the, the context. You know, that is sometimes students will rightly be begin a sentence with and out of a sense that it's appropriate in this context, right? But Google will tell them no. So they'll, they'll make that decision on the basis of this advice that they get. I'm so, getting lots of chats. Oh yeah, I, I have such, thank you. I have such a hard time. We're just like talking amongst ourselves. 
<laughs> yes, I, I don't. Doing it, I'm doing it because I can't hold on to thoughts for very long. And if I don't put them in the chat and wait to not interrupt you, I will lose them. So <laughs> please interrupt. <laughs> yeah, don't feel sheepish about that. I'm agreeing with your comment in the chat that, of course, uh, learning how to use the tools properly re also requires having the foundation of uh, of basic yeah. writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I have a tr trouble getting students to take me up on it, but one of the things I like to do in English 102 is say, um, when they come with a draft, say, oh, did you look at this? Like, did you look at the grammar checkers? Is there anything that's like underlined? Like, do you understand what that's for? <laughs> and then did you know if you click on it, you can get an explanation. Do you have some you read that explanation? Does it does it make sense to you? Does it, you know, um, and they don't always typically they, they do, but uh, but anyway, to um yes, I agree, and to put them in the, the position of having to think think it through. Yeah, because a, a lot of the errors that students have are cross-disciplinary, active, active voice and passive voice, for example, which is one of my biggest, you know, I've been a tutor for 10 years, over, over 10 years now. Um, and so, I mean, it's all the same premise. If they know how to change it to active, they'll understand how to change it to passive. And so they're very cross-disciplinary. So if we can catch them, maybe I guess I'm arguing sooner at, as like freshmen or maybe as sophomores in, in tackling these writing tactics or these very writing specific areas it can be really beneficial for the students and the professors to, who read their writing. <laughs> Karen, is that a raised hand? Oh, I was tapping for Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> other thoughts about this? Are there other things we should include or other I mean, I know you folks are the experts, but I have like called some resources and videos that I have used in my class. So if you wanted me to share those with you, I'd be happy to, but I certainly don't want to tell you folks what to do. And <laughs> I just thought just to, if we're trying to do this collaboratively kind of thing. Yes, so that'd be wonderful. Yeah, and we'd love to see them. Um, yeah, I like the idea of anything visual like videos too. You know, students are just so receptive to those. And it, it would be literally impossible to do it for every teacher across campus who gets writing. But I think that like Karen, um, I'm, I'm sure your students really enjoy reading your resources or, or whatever you share with them to let them know like, this is what I'm looking for. Like my students know I, I want really big ideas that are their own. Don't just tell me stuff because I say it a thousand times. Um, so whatever your personal um, wants are, I'm sure students love like, like that, gosh, I wonder what, what she wants from me, you know? To piggyback off of the, the comment that I just left, um, if anybody like in your departments uh, is willing to share like, um, you know, like a sample assignment where we're especially doing a, a whole section on this that's just for incoming freshman students. So, um, you know, we're trying to pull together some resources for them, especially to kind of be like, hey, welcome to college. Here's some of the stuff that you're going to be asked to write. You know, here's a couple of examples of assignments that you might get, you know. So if, if you know anybody or you you're yourself or anybody in your department who might be willing to share a, you know, small, a couple, you know, a couple just to kind of like have students see, okay, like here's something that I might be asked to do and like have them be able to look through it. And, you know, we could offer a small suggestion about why we offer this kind of assignment, you know, like what the purpose of it is, things like that. But we're looking to collect those sorts of things as well. I'll offer you up my Billy bookcase assignment. You're... Uh, the Billy bookcase is a uh, uh, classic piece of Ikea furniture, and I give them the international wordless assembly diagram and <laughs> have them have them do, uh, let's see, I think it's now three sets. First, they translate it into a set of written instructions in English. Second, they write a process essay just um, 
describing what they did in first person. I built this, I screwed this in. And then finally, the third one is to put it into passive voice. It's really interesting. Yeah, that, that, is, that is. That is yeah. very interesting. I can imagine that I'm in mean, connection with our discussion of sort of like um, um, genre and, and disciplinary variants. You know, you, you're, it's, it's not just us who's talking about this. Your professors too will approach you um, with um, uh, uh, assignments that fo maybe focus on expectations about um, your ability to cross genres, right? And maybe assignments to help you um, cultivate. So that'd be great. Thanks, Ian. Other thoughts for us here as we, the, the summer's yawning before us, as we get ready to, to um, sort of tackle this and have, oh, I, I guess I didn't say at the beginning, our, our plan um, is not to have this all ready for the fall, <laughs> which I think we could not do, but um, I think that we would like to do sec section kind of the, as much at least as we can of section one and section two, you know, what academic writing is for, why people do it. Um, and then two, a, a kind of orientation for students, especially in English one or two. Um, and maybe leave for now writing processes and rhetorical concepts, but also pull together grammar and mechanics, which I think we have a start on, and then sourced writing, which especially the, the Purdue Owl links, you know, the Purdue Owl, and I should say Penfield links too. Um, we want to take advantage of whatever sort of internal links we can. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, those pieces maybe will, fingers crossed, be kind of set up for, for the problem that's the game. Um, I, I do need to extend things if you're going to adjourn us, but um, I'd love to hear from Anne and Karen, especially um, about the, the tone that, that, that we've kind of discussed taking. Um, I don't know exactly how to characterize it, but, but not a clinical tone we were thinking, but something a little bit friendly, but a tiny bit formal. Um, but so I, I just, I'm, what, what kind of adjectives do you think would be good for tone in, in the, you know, like the common written section? Well, one of the other progressions that I do when I teach intro lab, um, I go from casual informal. So the day that they spend hopefully properly learning how to use Excel, <laughs> um, you know, all the students who think they know how to do it, but they don't actually know how to do it. It's impossible to grade a lab report where everybody's done the same Excel exercises, right? And they should come away with all the same graphs and data tables. So I ask them to write a letter home from camp and just have a narrative in a casual first person tone of what they did and what they learned. And so they see that that's one thing. And then a week later when we're doing measurements for the first time, I have them write it as a business memo. Well, is this widget that we just measured acceptable to purchase in bulk? Does it meet the specifications? So they have to do a little bit different and get a little bit more organized. And then I, you know, then we get into the more formal reports. So as I said, I'm not a professional <laughs> English writing person, so I don't even know the correct terminology to use. So, but I hope those examples answer. I usually try to, because a lot of them in my experience from the students I have in my classes, they write in what I call more of a conversational language. And I try to talk to them. These are students who are going to be technology teachers and technology managers. So I say, okay, pretend you're talking to your superintendent or your principal instead of your friends or your colleagues. Pretend you're talking to your manager or your vice president instead of talking to your friends and your colleagues. And so kind of try to put it a little more personal spin on that. I don't know. Is that what you're looking for? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I guess I was somewhat unclear. Like, yeah, I, I love that. Um, I'm just saying it, uh, with the in terms of the actual writing that we produce, we, we didn't want to be too informal or too like oh. or, or like pretending to be, you know, freshmen because that that doesn't work. Um, no, definitely a friendly tone, definitely a, a more casual or friendly tone, I think would go over better with the students. With, with uh, yeah, some level, some level of formality, but, but, yeah. Yeah, but definitely, so I didn't know what adjectives like, like you and Anne would encourage. 
Like we're definitely friendly. Adjectives. Okay. I think it could be more conversational and more like, you know, first person ish. Well, no, that would be second person, wouldn't it? You need to blah 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 kind of. We use first person in a sense. Like yeah, here's an example of the kind what I what I take you to mean, Ken. That um, like what kind of voice should we adopt here? Yeah, which I think is what you're. Yeah, um, and we did um, talk about that a good deal and, and work at that. That is, we wanted something that felt like. It was direct, like students felt like they'd been spoken to, not and not spoken down to, um, and not coddled. Like that, that it is that we wouldn't sort of reduce complexity, but we try to be as sort of clear and direct and understandable as possible. I think so far, students that, that I've shared it with have liked, have felt like it was understandable and clear. But we, but we were still really looking for kind of feedback about that. So here's an example of the kind of uh, language that we used. I don't know. So you, be difficult to, to read um, this at length uh, now, but if you if you guys have thoughts, I was going to invite you to to um, look at the pages mm -hmm. that and let us know if you. Well, interesting. In one of the sessions, I think it was with the dean yesterday afternoon. You know, uh, yes, you're trying to teach writing, but be careful not to write it at a level beyond them and maybe in the teaching itself use simpler sentence structures simpler sentence structures until you get to the point where you're teaching about more complex sentence structures um and in the broader sense of accessibility you don't want to turn them off right you want to make it so that it is approachable and they don't feel like they're being told that everything is wrong, but are encouraged that here's a way to improve what you're already doing, right? Yeah, I was at that session too. And um, I think she mentioned specifically that uh, a sixth grade reading level is the ideal um, to use for something for any sort of like public resource. She mentioned even because we were talking about the syllabus, right? Um, so she mentioned that, um, like, you know, writing it like a, at a sixth grade reading level was a was a good practice. I missed the beginning. Was that the accessibility session? No, um, Kristen did something about um, designing a sil or it was called like great ideas for your syllabus. And mm -hmm. she uh, was talking about she talked a lot about something called the student experience project and referenced that a lot. Um, so it was that session. It was yesterday, like, like Ann said, it was yesterday or early afternoon, maybe like one or something. Yeah, her examples were, you know, explain why you're giving them a quiz, explain to them why the quiz is necessary. Um, which I, when I think about it, wow, we always assume that they understand why there's tests and quizzes and homeworks, but actually offering explanations in the roadmap along the way. And uh, this could be very much the same thing. Um, so Karen and Anne, if you guys have a chance, Steve too, because I know, I don't think you've seen this. Um, if any, anybody has a, uh, is able to take a look at this and, you know, if you have some reactions at the level of a, the language and the tone and the, the the voice. You know, if we 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 seem to present these ideas in ways that will be accessible to students and command attention, um, and you know, by the way, to seem, make us seem like reasonable and approachable, <laughs> um, seem uh, I don't know, in some way pro properly um, uh, that we approach this in a in a, in a useful um, a way. Um, let, let us know. That's you know, if you have thoughts about. I I think the voice and the tone here is very nice. I put in the chat that it's uh, approachable but instructive. Good. Thank you. That's kind of what we we're shooting. I, I agree. Too. I agree. I agree too. Yeah. We are pretty much at the end of our allotted time. I don't want to um, uh, close before. We, uh, if anybody has anything else to say here, I'm just looking at that. Okay. Uh, okay. Bye bye, Stephanie. Um, and, uh, any, any sort of final thoughts or I know it looks like Amanda, you need to go too.
Thanks. I'm encouraged to keep up the good fight, as it were. <laughs> Great. And yeah, Anne, let me know if you want to talk both about the, um, the writing plan, um, as well as about that idea of a, a style guide. Well, right now, I think I'm going to slip in a revision to the writing plan that just covers the fact that since our last writing plan, university physics labs actually now finally have their own number, but they're functionally the same as the combined number was previously. And I'm not going to do big overhauls. I just want to actually smooth the rails for getting degree works updated. And, and I'll, I'll think about broader changes in, in the fall. Great. And yes, um, uh, let me know. I'm happy to, to sit with you a bit and, and talk about that. One thing I'll caution you, any change to the official part of the writing plan to course sequences and numbers and how it will how it will work in degree works, make sure you consult Chris Lalonde. Oh, yes, I'm already. It's on my summer to do list. I've already. It's because every time we had a student who, well, not often, but sometimes we would have students who would take one semester of college physics and the other semester university physics and i thought the way it was written uh, was such that it covered that condition but that now that university physics has its own number for its labs which are the writing part we found <laughs> we found that even though i thought it was covered there's now actually an exception so i just have to finish that up so i'm not going to rewrite the whole thing right now just just make it so that the registrar can program it into degree works. Right. So we don't have to keep pestering Chris for an approval. Yeah, that's my guess is that he, he'd be quite amenable to it. Oh yeah, I've already spoken to him, yeah. Yeah, all right, well, thank you very much for coming. And um, if you have any thoughts about any of this, or if you ever want to um, take a look at the progress as the summer goes on, you have the link. <laughs> You'll be able to see, see what we've done, so. Um, Thanks again. Bye, Ann and Karen. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks I a think lot for work on this. Yep. Yeah, may need approval to actually open the link when you have a chance. Yes, we do. I had to request approval as well. Oh, is that right? It should be open for public viewing. I thought the you mean the landing page? So whatever link you put in the chat that goes to your uh, slide deck, you, that goes to your slide deck, I had to request permission to view. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that no, was no worries. Let me give you the link to the home page here. Um, I'll just put that in the chat quickly before we're done. Stop recording. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is great for those of us who are teaching English, but not English teachers. <laughs> teaching writing, but not writing teachers. <laughs> I, I'm lucky I come from a family of humanities majors. I'm the stray scientist in the family. So, um, well, I was a, I, when I went to Oswego back a million years ago, I was admitted in the Honors College in Liberal Studies and Literature and then went to the Technology Department. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little much on the paper side for me. <laughs> All right, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. you I too. Put the Google okay. Sites uh, link in the chat if you Okay, if, thank you. Got it. I already bookmarked it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day, folks. Yeah. You, thanks for coming. Bye. Bye bye. More laundry. <laughs> <laughs> good luck bye. with it. Bye. Got to go home for mine.